The next portion of the program is sponsored by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. We're here for it all. Day one to year 100. The times you remember and things you'd rather leave behind. Standing by for the late nights, the midday surprises, and everything in between. We're here for it all and always will be. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Confidence comes with every card. Please welcome the President and Chief Operating Officer of Carhartt, Linda Hubbard. President of AT&T Michigan, David Lewis. Welcome back to the program, Jim Maltz. And back to moderate the discussion, Sandy Barua. Well, hey guys, uh, thank you uh, for, for joining us and also want to thank uh, uh, Jim and Rebecca for a great conversation. So uh, the job that the three of you have is, is, is really small. It's just to you know digest all the data that has been presented so far, all of Jim and Rebecca's comments, and come out the other side with learnings for our audience. So that's all you've got to do. All no right. Problems, Andy. No problem. Yeah. All right. So let's, uh, th th thanks for joining us. I'm going to start with this question. And uh, Linda, I'm going to start with you. A year ago is when we first started to learn and first started to pivot for this COVID experience. And we didn't know what that was going to be. Compare, Linda, your thoughts as to what you thought was going to happen a year ago versus how things actually unfolded in terms of your business and in terms of how your business operated? You know, the uncertainty of a year ago when we were basically all asked to leave our offices, shelter at home, uh, close your stores, for us, close our stores, close many of our, you know, not many of our retail partners had to close their doors, uh, close our manufacturing facilities till we could figure out how to keep people safe and socially distanced while they work. I mean, it was, uh, you know, just you expected the worst and you started to plan for the worst. You know, we certainly did. And um, just that uncertainty of that period of time was very unsettling. But uh, what we found, you know, a year later was about, a, you know, for us, we really benefited from being a consumer products company. So I know that service industry has you know, just been devastated in this uh, as a result of the pandemic. But um, what we found and what helped us was we still were um, available to people in essential retailers that stayed open, uh, stores like Myers and TSC and Home Depot. Uh, and so after people got done in those first couple of months buying the toilet paper, they finally wandered over and, you know, picked up a Carhartt jacket or a T-shirt. And so we started to see business coming back, our e-commerce business took off significantly. And um, we've just continued with the stimulus money, uh, the additional unemployment funds that were distributed last summer. And again, this December, we have um, seen this consumer spend uh, be very strong for products and, and, and that's really helped our business tremendously. Ken, uh, is it safe to say that uh, 2020 ended up being a better year for Carhartt than Linda Hubbard, the president of the company, expected it to be uh, in March and April of 2020? Absolutely. It certainly, it certainly was, yes. By, by a factor of what, Linda? Just, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much better did it was? Um, you know, I think we thought that we, um, you know, we would, we would, our business would obviously be down. And we ended up actually doing better than what we planned slightly uh, before we even knew about the pandemic. So going into the year, we had a plan. We overachieved, you know, that number. So well, we felt good about, you know, how we ended up. Well, that's a pretty dramatic change if you ended up doing better than your initial plan. So congratulations. I mean, and also congratulations just to all the success uh, that Carhartt has had. Uh, David, let me turn to you. AT&T, we have all been reliant on the products and services companies like AT&T have been, have been offering us. Tell us uh, the AT&T story, your story. What did you expect in March and April of 2020 and how, compared to how the year actually unfolded for your business? 
Absolutely. Well, it was kind of twofold. For us, from a customer perspective, we wanted to make sure that we were doing what we did before the pandemic. And that was to make sure that all of our customers were connected. As we always say, the only thing constant in our business is change. So we're always preparing ourselves for any type of pivot or evolution. But last year, our biggest concern was to make sure that our essential workers could be out working uh, to make sure that they were able to keep our customers connected. Uh, from an internal perspective, we wanted to make sure the employees that had to work from home, myself included, uh, were prepared, right? But what really concerned us the most was, were we going to be able to pivot to this kind of vertical structure when people working downtown Detroit or in other uh, metropolitan areas to working from home, a more horizontal landscape? So for us, from a small cell perspective through 5G, uh, for us, uh, from fiber uh, deployment, et cetera, were we going to be able to meet the demand and the bandwidth increase that's needed for us to keep our customers connected? And I am happy to report that we exceeded expectations. We thought that there would have been uh, a surge, uh, an increase in demand that was going to create a problem for us. Again, bandwidth uh, uh, over, over capacity. We were able to, to, to do exactly what we hoped we would do to keep in front of the curve and make sure that we were prepared and that our customers, both in their residential homes, as well as those who are now going back to the business, to their offices, were connected. So our, our concern was connectivity, but we feel really good that we were able to meet the customer's demands and there was not really a lot of negative to that. So we exceeded expectations and we're very proud of that. So uh, David, you're an executive and uh, one of the world's greatest telecommunications uh, and technology companies. Uh, what was it like transitioning your employees? I know you've got that big office in downtown Detroit uh, and you have offices in Lansing and, and, and other places. Uh, how easy was it for you as a technology leader to transition your employees to work from home? I mean, the rest of us don't have the, uh, the deep dive uh, experience in technology uh, and remote work that, that you did. Was it easier for you or did you have the same problems as, as uh, organizations like ours? Well, I, I'll tell you, anyone who works for me that said it was that it was uh, difficult, I have a problem with because at the end of the day, our job is to do that. Without the pandemic, we were still evolving into more, as you heard earlier, co-working spaces. You know, this if anyone calls this a phone, you're incorrect. In today's vernacular, this is a device that that gives you everything that you need. So whether you're working in a coffee shop, whether you're working at the airport, whether you're working from home, our job is to give you the connectivity. So for us, it was really not the focus on transitioning physically. You know, I, I provided my people with the right with printers, with the right equipment. It was really for us the the, the psychological factor of that a lot of my employees are external. We're out there. We're in the marketplace. We're meeting with our customers, our prospects. We're talking about FirstNet and everything else. So to have to do that from home virtually was my biggest concern. How can we adapt to that? But we've been very, very successful. Uh, our millennial employees concerned us the most, to be absolutely honest with you, because, you know, these millennial employees, as everyone can attest to, don't like to sit in one place at any time. So to tell them they have to now work from home, that was somewhat of a challenge. But we've adapted very well uh, from what I understand, and we have been polled inside the company within state by state that the overall transition was not as challenging as we thought, and employees are very pleased with the environment. Now, does everybody want to get back out in the marketplace and work and, and, and communicate and have lunch and dinners? Absolutely. But as of right now, everyone's in a very good place, and as a company, we did a very good job in pivoting to, the new, to our new normal. Great. Right. Well, thanks, David. Jim, same question for you. It's, it's March, April of 2020. You're looking at the citizen's uh, footprint. Uh, what are you thinking and what, you know, uh, what, what were you thinking then and what actually happened? Yeah, great, great question. So um, I had, like all of us, I'm sure, we put together here a plan for, you know, 2020 strategy. Here's how we're going to go attack the market, cover the market, bring value and ideas to our corporate clients. And you know, provide a healthy impact to our communities. And so obviously we got off to a great start January, February, and then half of March. Uh, and then things change as we all know it. So the last part of March, uh, pretty much the whole second quarter, those were probably the darkest and most uncertain times of the whole year. And so what I mean by that is um, all these plans you had to throw out the window and adapt, or otherwise uh, you had to figure it out. But then, you know, like David, you know, you're also accustomed to 
you know, your employees, your colleagues, your leaders, you're, you know, accustomed to, you know, market visits, uh, in-person meetings, dinners, uh, relationship building. And so for a lot of us, we had to learn to do it completely differently. And so, and obviously do more with less too. And so the other part of it is, is um, people had to shut down travel. In fact, I haven't been on a plane for work since I think early March. In some ways that's great, uh, but I'm starting to miss it immensely. I think I want to get back out there and do it. But uh, it's, so it's just a lot of us had to change, adapt, and figure out ways to uh, not only deal with your home life, and let's face it, the kids were home from school. Uh, there was things going on with health, families, colleagues, friends. And then you had to worry about your responsibilities at work. And so you had to strike that right balance as a leader to say, hey, you know, take care of home life first, get situated. And then at the same time, you know, let's over communicate and, you know, where you can't make to do something, people will help you. And so we got there um, and, you know, we learned how to present our businesses differently, our ideas and thoughts um, to our clients. Uh, in a weird kind of way, uh, Sandy, I will tell you that I think we got closer to our clientele during this pandemic, certainly in the early three or four months. And that's because you know, early on, this became a, su a supply chain problem and then it flipped to a demand problem. So a top line problem for our clients. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, what's your cash burn going to be? How are you guys doing for your liquidity purposes? What are you seeing, you know, week to week? Forget about the quarterly forecast. It's week to week. And so in a lot of ways, we had to reach out two, three times a week with our clients versus maybe in a normal environment, it was more like, you know, once a month um, or so. And so I think our clients and, and folks appreciated that, but we had to learn a different way of how we go to market. So hopefully going forward for the balance of this year, things will ease up for us to get back and balance it with some in-person meetings, some lunches, and, and some good business travel again. So, Jim, let me tie a couple thoughts that you just mentioned together. One, you mentioned, you know, that you hadn't been on a plane for work in about a year. Uh, but you also mentioned that, you know, those first few months of the crisis actually brought you closer to your clients. So going forward, you know, you know, obviously this this too shall pass. Right. We will go back to some sort of sense of new, new normal. What do you expect uh, the practices that you've had to employ during COVID will stick versus how much will you go back to the old normal? How, how are you going to balance that? What's your thought? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I would say, you know, pre-pandemic, it was probably 95.5 in terms of folks going in person and versus picking up the phone or video conferencing. Uh, I think going forward, you're going to see more of, you know, don't quote me on the percentages here, obviously depends on the situation and, and uh, issues with a, uh, the customer. Uh, but you're probably going to see more like 50-50, maybe 60-40. People still need to get out. We are social animals. We need to, you know, shake hands and you know look people in the eye and get to know folks, build relationships. But to your point in question, you, you're not going to see the way it was going back. You know, we're going to have to ask ourselves, and we're doing it now, do you really have to jump on a plane to go visit somebody in Detroit or Chicago or Atlanta when you could pick up their phone or have a conversation like we're having here today and achieve the same, um, you know, goals and objectives. So it's going to be a, a tricky balance on that, um, I think, uh, but it's not going to be the way it was. And because there's also expense issues involved, uh, companies are grappling with um, all kinds of expense um, cuts, if you will. How do you control expenses and things like that and try to Extract, contract the business and then hopefully we can expand it again and so what you can control is obviously that discretionary spend unfortunately you know at the expense of no pun intended travel industry leisure industry hospitality industry you know food service restaurants uh so hopefully though you know there'll be more of that travel going forward but it won't be to where it was pre-pandemic right. linda a similar question for you uh you have a supply chain network and a distribution network that literally spans the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can imagine that pre-COVID, uh, you know, you were on these international long haul flights probably more often than you'd want to be. Um, tell us about the last year and what you anticipate going forward for you, uh, your fellow executives at, at Carhartt. You know, you're right, Sandy. We, besides our own U.S. manufacturing, we also produce product through um, through contractor partners in 15 other countries around the world. 
So uh, yes, our design teams, our supply chain teams, and you know our other executives were on planes meeting with our suppliers um, to build new product and you know increase capacity and maintain relationships. And we did none of that, you know, physically. And it was an incredible challenge, particularly for the design team this past year, because, you know, it's a very tactile thing to be, you know, I'm wearing a car jacket now, it's very tactile to, to make clothing. And so our design team really had to learn how to do a lot of things remotely that, that were very challenging, you know, a lot of 3D design and things like that, which was already coming along. But those tools have accelerated so much and our teams have gotten so much more effective in using technology to do our work that I do, although I expect there will still be, you know, times for us to get together and make sure we're building relationships and, you know, spending the, you know, the, those dinners and those kinds of things just culturally around the world are, are very important, but I'm not certain that'll happen a lot in the rest of 21 and 22. Just, there's just the pragmatic, piece of how fast will will the rest of the world be vaccinated uh, and so that you know we have to factor that in as well our continued safety of our associates so you know I, I think it'll be different in the short term and probably less in the long term you know, uh, communicating uh, and, uh, you know across language barriers and cultural barriers international barriers uh, is is really a, is really much more of an art than it is a science. You know, so, you know, you obviously have the most international exposure of, of anyone on this call here. I, how did that work? I mean, you know, so much of that cultural understanding comes from being there and being able to, you know, uh, if you don't know the language really well, to be able to use a gesture to kind of ease an awkward situation. How did you and your team handle that through video? Yeah, I mean, the, the one fortunate piece is that we have um, some very solid and long-term relationships with, with these partners. And um, we were, you know, we were able to call on that reservoir of, um, of goodwill and relationships we already had, where um, I think it, it will be challenging as we grow and we continue to bring on new, you know, contractors or additional capacity, not having that time to get to know each other and to really walk their facilities with them and make sure that we are comfortable. You know, we had to use third party auditors related to social compliance, things that we would normally always do ourselves. Uh, we, you know, did have to rely on others to help us. And that, I mean, I don't think that's something we want to continue to do. We want to, we want to be there ourselves and make sure that they're the right long-term partners as we onboard new suppliers. Hmm. That's uh, that's really interesting, David. You know, uh, you're you're the technologist uh, of us here, so I'm, I'm going to put you in the role of helping our audience kind of forecast forward. You know, as we go into you know 2022. You know, obviously this year is still going to be a year of transition. You know, what are some of the trends that you and your AT and T colleagues? Uh, think that the rest of us should should know or understand about you know how we're going to be using technology differently how we might be working differently how we might be interacting differently uh uh you know i would we'd love at t's you know thought on this or your thoughts yeah, on this absolutely so you know I, I think people have to start thinking about the evolution of the workforce uh and the training and education of the workforce and that's what we're here to do our job is to connect you where you need to be so we talk about the evolution of the workforce and we talk about the unemployment rate uh, being uh, at a very high rate right now, uh, more people need to rescale res and retool. Uh, so there's a lot more opportunities now for online learning. So what needs to happen is for your current workforce or your future workforce, uh, there's got to be that environment that's created there. So the future that we're investing, again, over the last couple of years, AT&T, actually every two years, we invest between 1.4 and 1.5 billion in Michigan alone in infrastructure inv advancement, enhancement, sustainability, reliability, speed, and coverage. So our job is to make sure that we get in front of where your increased demand goes. So from a workforce perspective, it's all about the workforce, the evolution of that workforce, right? So our job is to make sure that you're ready. So as companies prepare themselves for the future, you have to make sure to understand that the current workforce appetite is more of a environment that you're seeing right now, right? Not actually in the office, but can work from home, work from anywhere, having the connectivity that you need to move forward. 
businesses now, it doesn't matter what line of business that you're in, from a retail perspective where the jobs are, are being lost, from uh, investment banking, the whole nine, you have to be prepared. And I just want to address something really quick, too, about this education gap and connecting. For us to focus on the workforce today, we have got to bridge this digital divide. And AT&T is focusing a lot of our resources in making sure from a spectrum and a 5G perspective that we are trying to do everything we can to connect households and students in households to make sure they have the ability to take get the online learning that they need so that they can be prepared for the jobs of the future that's going to be at your very company. Right. Jim, financial services. Yes. How can we expect the financial services industry to look different or perhaps not uh, as a consumer, you know, going into 2022 and beyond? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I mean, the, the evolution of technology in our industry and in our business has just been mammoth. Um, and you're going to see much more of that, you know, partnerships, joint ventures with fintechs, um, you know, financial services companies. I think most of us, if not all, tout themselves as tech companies now. And so you have a lot of, you know, obviously the use of metrics, data analytics, AI, um, and things like that. So going forward, you're going to continue to see more of that, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. I think um, there's always going to be a need, given where we are now with rates being so low and have been so low for a while. You always have to be disciplined around costs and expenses. And so how do you do things, you know, cheaper, more efficient and obviously provide the same result to your end, you know, your end customer. And so that battle is always going to happen. I think uh, as we get more modernized in the industry and some capacity um, you know, being taken out through uh, joint ventures and mergers, um, I think even with that, I think, you know, from a the element of employment, uh, we humans, uh, I think um, it's just more and more of us are going to be kind of out uh, due to technology within the industry, as it is in most businesses and most sectors right now. I think it's just a it's just a fact of you know, the truth. And so uh, we just got to find ways to getting back to David's point, the digital divide and also about the income gap and also you know, the, the underserved communities that uh, we all live and work in, we gotta find ways to bring those people up and how do we lift those folks up? And I think that to me is the big key going forward. And uh, Jim, we're, we're running out of time, uh, but I do wanna ask you about uh, the, your workplace culture. I know that's something that, yeah. that you have really focused on making you know, citizens a, a great place to work. Uh, how is that going to uh, unfold going forward? Yeah, I mean, uh, pre-pandemic, all of us were in the office, you know, and you're kind of doing your thing and you're, you're going out on your normal day, meeting with people. Now, you know, last nine months to a year, you know, people are more restrictive. In fact, uh, our offices, you know, across the Midwest, which I manage, are still technically closed, even though I'm in mine today, you still have to get permission to do so. And so culturally, it's been, again, getting back to what I was mentioning, using um you know, technology such as this to communicate and how good can you be at it? And you're still getting the messages across and can you still win business and can you still service people? And so culture has changed a lot in that regard. And, it, and I think uh, folks have adapted to it. It's been a little harder as leaders though, to maintain kind of the traditional culture that everybody was accustomed to. But in some ways I think that's good because everybody's out of their comfort zone. We're all learning uh, something new every day in this uh, virtual environment. And so when we get back to kind of a more balanced uh, uh, approach um, again. It's it's culture still is the secret sauce for any company, and we just got to work that much harder to make sure people are um, doing all the right things you need them to do. And at the same time, we have to be empathetic as leaders because everybody's situation is different, inside and outside of the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, Linda, speaking of being different, you get the last question. Now, you're in manufacturing. Hard to do that remotely. Can't you can't as assemble a Carhartt jacket through Zoom? So how do you think your organizational culture will change or will it or, you know, how, you know, how does the future look uh, that you're going to have to do things differently as the leader of Carhartt to keep that special sauce that you have as an organizational culture? You know, a big part of our heritage is being a manufacturer and we are the largest workwear manufacturer still in the United States. So we, um, we really, it, it's part of our our DNA to, to make product ourselves. I mean, we make product for people that make things. 
So we need to be makers too. So we're, you know, we have been, we did reopen our plants very quickly, uh, initially actually to sew masks and gowns, which we later donated to for PPE. But then we started making Carhartt again and we're still doing that. So we, we will continue to have a huge portion of our workforce, you know, on site every day making product. And, um, and people that have to support that as well as the whole distribution function. So uh, we, we're talking about our corporate offices and, and I think we still all feel we wanna be together to collaborate. And there are things definitely people can do remotely, but just you know, understanding that we have a big part of the workforce on site. We're not saying that everyone has to be there all the time, but we feel there's still that value of face-to-face -face collaboration. Great. Well, thank you. Well, Linda, you get the last word. And as we wrap up uh, our session today, first of all, I want to thank uh, the three of you, Linda, David, Jim, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and adding your perspective. I want to thank our other uh, guests, Jay Farner and Rebecca Jarvis. Uh, of course, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Jim and the team at Citizens, uh, our longtime sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Rocket Mortgage, Comcast Business, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and Lake Michigan Credit Union. I wanna thank my colleagues at the Detroit Regional Chamber that worked so hard to bring this data and produce this program for all of you today. And I wanna thank you, the audience, for spending your valuable time with the Detroit Regional Chamber this morning and early afternoon. Now, usually for our State of the Region event, we meet over lunch. This is an annual tradition that we miss and we will get back to that. But while we can't be in person this year, we want to be together in spirit. So the chamber will be hand delivering a very nice thank you gift to all of you who logged on as opposed to showed up to our event today. Please watch your email for the details on scheduling the delivery of this gift to the address of your choosing. So thank you all for your time. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And with that, I wish you all a good day. Thank you all.